Right, here we go again. So, Chelsea, we heard what your dad said. He basically thinks you now know it all and are almost certainly going to run America. So, thoughts? Oh, um, I'm, I'm grateful that I have a proud father. <laughs> again, very political. Um, let me start with you, Mutar, if I may. Obviously, both you gentlemen, two of the most experienced uh, bosses of two of the biggest companies in the world. The key issue, it seems, talking to almost everybody that I've talked to at the UNGA and also the CGI, is jobs, jobs, jobs. How do you get this situation of this younger, larger population around the world into work, particularly when their skill base perhaps isn't quite what it needs to be to work for someone like Coca-Cola? Um, first, both companies start with a C, so we've got something in common. <laughs> I think we also see that uh, it, it begins with growth. You know, you've got to find ways in today's environment, first on a micro basis, basis to crack the co calculus for growth, continue to crack that calculus for growth. And, and growth, um, repeating growth, achieving growth is one thing, but repeating growth is much more difficult in today's environment. So what, a comp what can you do? That's what we look at every single day. What can we do to continue growing in the world? And uh, you might have said growing e is e easier in emerging markets than in Western markets, but we look at the whole world and we say we've got to grow everywhere. Different rates of growth, obviously. And when you grow, you can invest. And when you invest, you can hire. That's, so we are hiring, we are growing. In the last five years, we've added about 15,000 jobs every year to our pretty big base of 700,000 around many, the how world. How many cans of Coke do you sell a year? Um, we, we get invited into uh, people's lives about 1.8 billion times a day. A day? A day, and, and that's about 3,000 products. Um, and how many people, I've always wanted to ask you this, how many people know the exact final recipe with all ingredients? <laughs> there are a few, and that's... Uh, how many? We don't always travel together, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, so, so cracking, the, you've got to keep on growing. And that becomes m much more difficult. If you t look at the environment in, in Europe, and we, we've heard how difficult it is in places like Greece and, and, and uh, Spain, how do you continue to grow, um, invest, and, and find avenues for growing your business in the United States? So that's one thing. The second thing is, in terms of jobs, it is a pretty dire situation out there because you know the latest figures are youth unemployment, ILO numbers, 90 million, 100 million. But that, the real number is much bigger than that. Because uh, if you go into, if you just take Africa, a billion people, um, including North Africa, Middle East, uh, about 300, China uh, and India, you've got th almost three, more than three and a half billion people. That just those places to keep the unemployment level at today's levels of over 100 million for the youth in the world you've got to generate an additional 160 million new jobs. And that's not, we're not doing that right now. We're, today, the number is way below that. So we keep, we're actually adding to the unemployment. And so there is no question that it is probably the biggest societal issue today because generations are for the first time beginning to feel that th their future is more bleak than the previous. Then the other thing that I, we, as a company, just to bring it back to reality, what, what we do is try to connect your passion points as a company, as a business, to creating jobs outside of your four walls. What do I mean by that? We are very passionate about water. and We have a goal for being water neutral by 2020. We respect water and we create awareness to respect water. So we are creating, um, we've now, launched a, a, a commitment here yesterday at, at CGI to place these new machines that make a thousand liters of vaccine grade ster sterile water out of any water, sewage, arsenic contaminant, any water. We're, make, we're putting these kiosks out and manning them with women entrepreneurs, young women entrepreneurs. So a passion point, get, point gets connected through the golden triangle of government, business, and civil society to creating jobs. We're very passionate about recycling. We have a goal to recycle 50% of every package that we sell by 2015. So we've created a, an organization called Coletivo in Brazil, employing 45,000 people recycling 
and creating also uh, clothing wear out of recycled PT material and selling that, 45,000 people. Those are the kind of things I think that are really important, veterans programs. We've got a, a fitness for troops program, we hire veterans, and we uh, See, that, work with really, cities. Well, that's an interesting issue because, I think, John, you have the same, don't you, at, mm -hmm. at Tisco? And it, listening to this is it's fascinating to see the thought process when you're running one of these big companies. From your point of view, you wrote a fascinating piece recently about the internet and where it yes. was going because actually, globally, internet use is <coughs> still percentage wise relatively low. Mm -hmm. What happens when that accelerates very, very fast? Well, I think it was Chelsea in America in one of your earlier panels that said it the best. They said to get in, uh, employment going back, especially among the youth, and to do it on a gender basis as well, you've got to have the tools, which is the internet and broadband, and then you've got to have the training. You combine those two, that's how you put youth around the world back to work. Give you an idea, you've got to do it on a large scale. We do network academies, which train young people to install equipment, be able to do security over it, etc. Started with a small scale. Today, we have 1.25 million students around the world in these academies. They are much more likely to get jobs at higher paying or go on to advanced education. In a, the Arab world, let's use Saudi Arabia as an example, 17,000 students a year, 50,000 students through the program since we started. Out of that, 42% are women because they see the chance to get a job. Jordan, the same thing, 44% are women. So if you have the training and you have connection to broadband, every government leader in the world, and I talk to them all, understand it's about job creation and it's about inclusion of all the groups within their country. Two quick examples. An individual out of South Africa. Uh, basically, Monarch is a individual who's going blind. We train about 17,000 South Africans a year. And he had a choice between staying in high school or staying in the network academy. He took the network academy because he felt that if he went blind, he'd have a higher probability of getting a job. Fast forward three years later, gainfully improved, actually was able to get some spatial lenses, which changed his sight. And when I interviewed him the other day, he said, John, what I want is a job with you. <laughs> uh, and a young lady in Jordan, same approach. And uh, basically with Wasan, uh, she said, uh, it gave me a chance in a male-dominated world to really participate. And she's skilled through the network academies like her colleagues. She led a group of women in a very collaborative environment. That's what the millenniums are all about. And today she leads as a first-line manager for us. And when I asked her where she wanted to go from here, she said, I want to be your head of services, 20,000-person organization. Key takeaway here is if you give people access to the Internet, you give them the training, you can get jobs. And we need to find a way to do that on a much larger scale. If one company can do it like Cisco or Coca-Cola, think what we could do with public service. Think what we could do with the million people returning who have protected our country. Let me ask Chelsea about a bugbear of mine, which is that you look at companies like these, multinational global companies, same in particular someone like Apple, who just had the most extraordinary few days of sales of their latest iPhones, everyone going crazy for it. I'm a BlackBerry guy, I'm standing firm. Um, but good, good luck with that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I am the last man standing firm, but I'm standing firm. Yeah. Um, in terms of corporate responsibility, and I'll get the gentleman to answer after you've had your say here, but it's always struck me as a bit perverse that we have such a chronic jobs crisis in America that you have companies like Apple still outsourcing maybe 90% of their workforce to China or wherever it may be. Howard Schultz at Starbucks has actually started to try and tackle that head on by opening some factories deliberately in America that he would otherwise have outsourced to save money on the belief that actually Americans would reward him for that patriotic duty and buy more of his product if he did that, which I applaud, uh, whether he's successful or not, I applaud it. Is there, a, as he put it, a moral capitalism ahead where American global companies should bring more jobs back to America? Well, I think um, both Mutar and John uh, are examples of a moral capitalism in their own stories as they've just relayed. You know, whether it is Coca-Cola's clear commitment to clean water, um, because I imagine whatever the secret ingredients are in the super secret recipe, water is one of them. <laughs> you know, I think that that commitment will likely be... You didn't even flick it. You see no, that? No, it was very cool. You wouldn't even confirm water. He didn't water. even <laughs> confirm water. That is wow. Cool. <laughs> You'd have been a great James Bond villain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I think that is a, is 
a more durable, sustainable commitment for Coca-Cola as a company, not only because of Muchar's leadership, but because of its clear connection to at least what I presume mm -hmm. is a core uh, necessary ingredient in Coca-Cola, not Massive only today, assumption but you're making in there. the future. You'll find out if you, when you become president. Oh, I don't know. Our... It's you, the Pope, and the Queen of England, and him. <laughs> <laughs> it, it enviable company for anyone. Well, well, let me ask these two chats now. I mean, because it is a serious issue, isn't it? I mean, have you thought about this as a company, about the need, perhaps, to say, OK, it's cheaper to make cans of Coke in China, wherever it may be, but we're going to bring some back, more than we would have done from a financial point of view, to make a point that we need to re-energize the American jobs market by doing that. Yeah, I think for us, we're such a local business everywhere. We operate more than a thousand factories, peers across 207 countries. So that doesn't apply to us. But I think the key is what can we do in every country where we operate to continue to create employment opportunities, both inside the four walls of the company, but also outside by the multiplier effect. Because all of our companies have so many relationships down the supply chain with people who make our packaging, people who do the advertising, people who uh, give us the trucks, the refrigerators, the same thing with all the suppliers that uh, John's company has. So when we are healthy, growing, investing, the supply, smaller companies, so every study has shown that for every one job that we create, the 700,000 that we have directly inside our own company, our system, our, with our partners, there's another 10 jobs created down the supply chain. That's really important. And uh, whether it's uh, citrus plantations, whether it's juice plant, you know, f uh, uh, groves, uh, uh, fruit groves, all of those create jobs down the supply Which chain. Which particular but fruits are we talking? For us, all fruits. I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get inside your <laughs> yeah, tangled web of secrecy. <laughs> but, but Pierce, I do think that you know there also is a role of government here too, and not just kind of in the ways in which we heard yesterday in the opening plenary, where there was a discussion about. Um, tax arbitrage, but are we as a country investing in our young people so that Mutar and John want to employ them in the future? Right. And I mean investment holistically. You know, in our 30 some odd thousand public high schools, only 6,000 of them have computer science programs. Which is ridiculous. Which is ridiculous. And so it actually leads me to a question. I want to bring in General Wesley Clark here. You now, before you jump in, I yeah. want to follow up on that. Okay, sure. Because from a corporate General, point of view, standee. Wes, this is the first time I've overruled you. Uh, if you watch corporate social responsibility. Nobody's ordered him around like that for a long time, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> corporate social responsibility is a must for the future of capitalism. If we don't, we're going to be on the outside looking in. And contrary to what a lot of people have learned, those companies that are really focused on corporate social responsibility do much better in the countries around the world. And does that include, though, companies like Apple in particular? I mean, they're an example because they're so successful. They do make so many of these phones abroad and then bring them back to America. Where you have that kind of business, yes. should you have a sense of moral capitalism towards it and say, you know what, we need to make more of these in America? The answer is yes. But watch Cisco as an example. We're the only large corporation in high tech that still has been around for 25 years and has the majority of our employees in America. We want to continue to do that. Chelsea's right. We've got to have help from government. But also, the most successful should be the best at giving back. And this is where, when you win the first Clinton Global Citizen Award, which we did five years ago, or you win an award for basically helping law enforcement and the firefighters support their children who have died in the line of work, that's the right thing to do as a company, but it's also really good to attract the best talented people for it. So corporate social responsibility, giving back by those who can afford it, is also good for growth. And wait, and Piers, I'm, so, I'm sorry, General. General, stand down. Twice. <laughs> I, we'll get to you, but there's a lot of you, very bossy people. You will make a good leader here at Chelsea. Uh, we're yeah. going to get along uh -huh. fine. I, she I will be your commander-in-chief, yes. so <laughs> she's allowed to. Oh, Piers. Uh, <laughs> oh, Chelsea. Know, I think, though... <laughs> <laughs> we could have a comedy routine here. <laughs> I, I, I think we already do. Um, you know, it's important that... The, that People understand this isn't just rhetorical. I mean, John and I were in a conversation yesterday, yes. and CEO after CEO from multiple different industries, financial services, consumer products, said, I mean, we have consistently seen that our employees that are the most engaged with our corporate social responsibility programs are those that we promote faster, they stay longer, they're our future leaders. 
So it's not just sort of the morally right thing to do, it also really is the smart thing to do. Yeah. Agreed. And now by huge public expectation, <laughs> uh, no pressure at all, but this better be a bloody good question, General Clark. <laughs> We've been waiting for this for a long time. Over to you. Well, I, I feel like the paratrooper whose plane can't find the drop zone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're over the drop zone. So my question is the men and women who come out of uniform, especially the young veterans. You know, we never built the volunteer army to fight a sustained war. We, we never could have imagined we'd be in conflict for 11 years or 12 years going on 13 now. And yet that's what we've done but we can't keep sending the same men and women back into combat again and again and again. When they're 18, when they're 22, they go back again, and 26, they go back again, and so forth. We're destroying lives and families. So when they get out, they've got to have a place in the American economy. Uh, President Obama's talked a lot about it. We've done a lot about it. The Department of Labor is working on it. I, I know there's dozens and dozens of business initiatives, but are we going to be able to sustain this, and are we really getting traction on getting employment for our young veterans. That's okay. the question. Well, both these companies have programs that run for the veterans. It is a big issue. Briefly, if you don't mind, but you go first, Matol. What do you think? We do have a program, a robust program, 6,000 uh, that we've hired so far. We And this the year that we're in now, about uh, more than 1,000. Uh, last year was 880. So we do have a program. Uh, and, it, and, you know, it's so good for the whole organization. What we've known, you know, what we've seen is that uh, there's so much positive that comes out of bringing in these veterans because and training the veterans and putting them to work uh, on a permanent basis, um, and also um, using programs where we uh, employ veterans on a part-time basis, bringing them in and and uh, employing them, and then giving them the first right uh, for the next round of employment. So uh, very useful, and then linking them to some of the passion points that we have, as I mentioned, with right. uh, troops uh, for, for exercising, uh, imp improving exercise, improving nutrition across many cities. We have now programs, again, uh, agreements with uh, at least seven cities in the United States where we're doing this program uh, for uh, uh, troops uh, um, for uh, movement and troops for exercise and nutrition. Uh, John, before we get to your program, I want you to talk about that. There's also this wider issue, isn't there, about an education system that may not be preparing the modern American youth well enough for the jobs that are available. How do you deal with that? And then also tell me about your program of veterans. So the answer is our K-12 through system is broken. All of us as CEOs know that. We're not preparing our youth for the jobs of the future. And I think there's no better example than our military. The men and women who have given so much to protect this country and other countries, a million of them are coming back. 18% of the young people under the 24 years of age who come back do not have jobs. That should be something unacceptable in our country. We have to mobilize government and business working together, not just to create 100,000 jobs, but a million jobs for these people. And we've got to think about how do you do programs to prepare them for where the jobs are. Uh, General, I've had a chance to talk with a number of your colleagues also. The Army and the Navy and the Air Force does a great job on training young people. But we have to, the last six months of service, train them to be able to get jobs as they come out. The business has to have the courage to say, we'll work with you. You give them six months of training, we'll give them six months of training, and we will employ them. And this is where I think the First Lady is right. She's been a tremendous champion on this. I actually was representing high tech at the White House on the topic. But we ought to, instead of saying, how do we do 10,000 jobs or 100,000 jobs, how do we get a million jobs? I think this country is capable of doing that. I think it's time for a call of action to do it. Chelsea, final. Oh, wait, <coughs> yeah, after you. No, please. Thank you, Pierce. Um, You're the boss. Well, <laughs> you will we're, be. We're so happy you joined. <laughs> we're so happy you joined the Clinton Foundation team. Um, you know, I think this is also where national service, yes. civilian service, can play a role. Um, we were talking about AmeriCorps earlier, and the you know significant gap that exists today between the demand among young people to serve in a civilian capacity and the current supply that we're providing at the national, state, and local um, aggregate level. Um, I think you know, study after study has shown that a civilian service pathway as a transition for our men and women in uniform um, helps them not only be healthier um, physically and mentally, um, but then be more long-term employable and then to be likely to have long-term employment. So that seems just so clear to me that we would 
truly invest in AmeriCorps and other civilian service opportunities. And you know, just as John was saying, you know, that he believes we can create a million jobs for our million young men and women who are leaving our ranks of service, you know, during the Great Depression, the Civilian Conservation Corps um, enabled more than three million largely young men uh, to serve our country who otherwise would have been unemployed. You know, we mobilized that program within three years. You know, we know that we can do this when we dedicate our time and energy. You know, I was originally a skeptic on the program and the public service approach, but if you look at an unemployment rate of our young people of 15 percent, if we had a program instead of the individuals having to accept givebacks from the government saying how don't we apply that business apply part of it and get an aggressive goal of a million people back to work let's connect their skills and train them to where the jobs are let's give them access to new technology such as the internet and by the way on the military what we do very carefully is if you've ever read a military resume it's like reading French and German at the same time you just can't translate it what we did is say, let's so combine. help that software become easily available. We <laughs> just did. So you're the perfect setup. We translate the resume into things that are very applicable for the jobs for the young men and women coming back that match their skills. And our hit rate, uh, General, has been 50% of the job fairs have gotten jobs that day. So this is where business and government must do a better job of working together. It's what the Clinton Global Initiative is all about. But I think this is one our country has to get behind more aggressively. I totally agree with you. It's been you fascinating talking to you all. Chelsea, mm -hmm. final question for you. This came to me really just in the last few seconds, but do you play board games with your parents, like Scrabble? And if so, who wins? So we generally are a card-playing family. We do play some board games. Which card games? Oh, we play pinochle, spades, hearts, all variants. And of very coming. competitive, I'd imagine. Deeply competitive. Who wins? Thankfully, it's a pretty equal distribution. I think otherwise... <laughs> uh, How did I know you'd say that? <laughs> it's true. You uh, tell me you all win 33% so, of the time. <laughs> in cards, probably. In Scrabble, my mother's very good in Scrabble. Ah. In Boggle, my father's probably better. Your dad's the best boggler in the Clinton Probably house. the best boggler. <laughs> my mom's probably the best... Scrabbler. And you are the best. Pretty good at upwards. Everyone's equally probably pretty. Mm. Um, what are you best at? Um, I do really well in the traditional board games, backgammon, checkers. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> Sadly, we have run out of time. It's been fantastic. Uh, to John you. Mutar, and of course, to, especially to Chelsea, who's done two panels, and to the great audience. Thank you all yes, very much thank indeed. You all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.